Amen, amen. How many of you guys know Thanksgiving is right around the corner, and then Christmas is going to be not long after that? So we have family dinners that are going to be happening, and I want to know from you, if your family is like my family, if you want to make things really uncomfortable, really fast, if you want Thanksgiving to go south, then you just bring up faith and politics. Is that your family? Raise your hand. Is that your family? Only a few of you, really. My family. Whoo, son. We're going to do both today, all right? We're going to do both today in the house of God. Uh, it's going to, I'm just going to preface this. It is going to get a little uncomfortable today in God's house, but don't be, don't be scared. Don't be worried. Today is going to be a very, very good message. It's going to be very informative. It's going to be very biblical. As you know, uh, we have been in 40 days of prayer and fasting for America. How many of you all know America needs prayer? Amen. Amen. We need prayer. I don't know if you see what I see, but I truly believe in my heart of hearts that our country is on the brink of distinction. I believe that we are so close to losing everything that we have had for, for, for generations and we are really on the brink, and we're going to have to get super serious as the church of Jesus Christ if we want to see things change. So um, today, we're going to bring you a, a message that we're calling, How Would Jesus Vote in 2024? Now, let's be really honest. If Jesus were here in the flesh, and he was standing next to you at the polls, wouldn't you want to know how he was voting? Yeah. That's what I want to know. I don't know about you, but I know I would want to know how would Jesus vote in 2024? So before we move forward with the message, I do want to bring credit to a few Bible teachers, pastors who have just done an incredible job gathering a lot of valuable content that you're going to hear in today's message. One of those is Gary Hamrick and another is Josh Howerton. I encourage you to look on YouTube at their messages. They're incredible pastors. They do a much better job than we could possibly do sharing this content. I encourage you to check them out. So some of you, right off the bat, you might be asking yourself the question, what the heck? What about the separation between church and state? Like, I thought that was a thing, right? Nope, not a thing. Uh, so let me help you understand the, the context and the history behind this phrase, because we hear this phrase thrown around a lot in society. And let's just, let's just learn today what this phrase is all about. First of all, what we need to know about the phrase is that it is not in the Declaration of Independence. It is not in the Bill of Rights. It is not in the Constitution. Yeah. It's in none of those documents. So you might ask yourself, where does this phrase, separation of church and state, come from? So let me tell you. First of all, let me ask a question, because this always interests me. How many of you guys truly love and enjoy history? Raise your hand if you like history. Good. We've got a good history crowd. If you're watching online, I seriously want to know from you, because I'm going to go back later and, and look. How many of you guys just actually love history? Just wave your hand online if you love history. I do too. Uh, in 1802, in a personal letter, uh, Thomas Jefferson was responding to the Baptist Convention from Danbury, Connecticut, and they were inquiring about their religious liberties, okay? And in, this, was not a, this was a personal response by President Thomas Jefferson. This was not some official executive order. This was no law, no legislation. It was simply a phrase that he used in a letter and it's been massively used out of context for generation after generation after generation. So essentially what he was saying in response to this Baptist convention uh, is that he did encourage that there would be a wall of separation between church and state, but not, not the intent, if you read it in the context, what was it to affirm that our First Amendment rights limits governmental intrusion in the affairs of the church and, and when it comes to religious freedom. He explained that the First Amendment right was given to us in part to keep the government out of the business of the church, right. not to keep the church out of the business of government. Think about it this way. Who invented government? God did. 
God invented government. So government doesn't tell us. They don't tell the church how to do church. The government needs to stick to government right. business. But if the church has a problem with it, the church needs to speak up yeah. and tell government how to do government business. That's how this works. We are the people. This, this nation, this union of states, yeah. right, is ran for the people and by the people. Yeah. And all of, our, all of our legislators, all of our public officials, yeah. their public servants, they work for us. They do what right. we tell them to do. Yeah. We are the church and we have a voice and yeah. God has called us to use our voice for him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we are not, and we need to say this kind of as a disclaimer because we're probably gonna have some people walk out and that's okay. No one's, no one's here to judge you. We love you. But here's the reality that you need to understand as pastors. We love you. We love all of you guys watching online. But we as pastors are not here for any person's approval. Any one of you. We love you, but we're not here. We're not motivated by what you think about us. We're motivated by what God says in his word and what God says about us because one day we won't stand before you or government or anyone else. We will stand before God and give an account to the office, to the position, the leadership that he's blessed us with as pastors of the local church. And so we are always going to say what needs to be said, when it needs to be said, how it needs to be said according to the word of God. So you need to understand it is the, the preacher teacher's role and responsibility to take the text of God's word, yes. or in other words, God's holy standard for humanity, and overlay it with the context of the culture that we're living in today. Yes. That is our job. Amen. Our job is to reveal to you as students of the word, we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved. We want to reveal to you what God's word says and how culture compares. Right. So we're going to share some things today. I'm sure are going to offend some people and that's okay. That's okay. But it's our responsibility, our God-given responsibility to preach the truth without apology. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do today. Yeah. You guys ready? <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So as we begin today, we want to help you to understand that there are three institutions that we currently see in our society that were created by God and we find them in the word of God, all right? The first one that we see that God created is the family. You go to Genesis chapter one, you're gonna see very clearly. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Verse 28 says, then God blessed them and he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. God created the family. It was his idea for male and female created in his image to honor and glorify him throughout their life. The second institution that we see laid out in the word of God that God created is the local church. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16. He said, upon this rock, he was talking to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is his church. The third entity, institution that was created by God, whether you believe it or not, maybe you didn't know this, was government. The government was instituted and created by God. And I would just say, you need to go read Romans chapter 13. All right, here's an assignment for you for the week. Go read Romans chapter 13. I'm gonna read verse one. You can read the rest of it this week. It says this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. And those who exist have been instituted by God. So we have to understand in our culture, in our society, that God is the one who instituted the family, the church, and the government. At the same time, you need to be fully aware that everything God created, there is an enemy who wants to twist and distort and destroy what God has created. If you don't believe me, go to Genesis chapter 3 and read the story of the fall of man. What do you see in the fall? You see the garden. You see Adam and Eve in this perfect world. You see the serpent, the enemy, come and have a conversation with Eve. She begins to dialogue with the enemy, questioning what God has said. All the while, Adam, her husband, is standing right 
beside her. You're like, I didn't know that. I don't have time to teach that. Read it for yourself. He was right there. What does that tell us? That tells us if we're not going to stand up, if men, if you're not going to stand up and leave your home, the enemy will. All right. The second thing that we see is the church. Go to the book of Revelation and you see seven churches in the first few chapters that God is reprimanding. Why? Because they were allowing the culture of the day to influence the church. You see, that's not how it's supposed to be. The church through the word of God and our life and the stand that we take should be influencing the culture, not the culture influencing the house of God and the people of God. We don't bow to culture. We don't compromise because of the culture. We stand on the word of God. And if we're not gonna lead, if pastors are not gonna stand up and lead in the house of God, the enemy will. And the same goes for our country, for our government. If the godly will not stand up and speak up and have a voice and a backbone in our culture today, the godless will lead, period. The enemy will lead through the godless. And so today you need to understand very clearly that it is time for us, the church, to wake up. It is time for our voice to be heard. And you say, how is my voice supposed to be heard? Man, I've been on social media trying so hard. Listen, it's great. I love social media. Post some scriptures, post devotions. That's great. You don't need to get on social media and start debating. That's not the platform. Really, it, if anything, it probably does less good than more. People aren't looking at that, okay? Your voice is heard when you go to the polls and you vote. That's how your voice is heard. You may think to yourself, you know, well, I don't, I don't fully agree with everybody. That's, you know, I don't, I don't agree with the candidates. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But before I get to that, I want to tell you what happened in the 2020 election. In the 2020 election, presidential election, there were 25 to 30 million Christians who did not vote. 25 to 30 million did not vote. And currently today, there are 15 million citizens of the United States who claim to be Christians who are not even registered to vote. Let me just tell you something, church. God has called us to lead in every way, shape, and form, according to his word, the absolute truth. And when we choose not to, what we're doing is, you, is saying, you know what, God, I'm just going to leave it in the hand of the godless, and then I'm going to complain about it all the while. You have no right to complain about anything if you're not willing to stand up and take a stand in our country today and make your voice heard by going to the polls and voting. All right, so we're asking the question today, how would Jesus vote in 2024? Let's start with how he wouldn't vote according to Scripture. The, the first thing that comes to my mind is that he wouldn't vote based on feelings or emotions. Right. Think about how emotional and feeling-based a lot of people are with their voting. If I had time to really tell the story and go into it, it's fascinating. My son Tyler, the other day, we were sitting around the kitchen table, and he said, he said, Dad, did you know that, um, that uh, President Nixon... Uh, uh, or, you know, they're running against JFK was actually leading in the polls big time. He was going to destroy him in the election until they televised the debate. And America. And it was the first debate it was that the had first ever been debate televised. That had ever been televised, and, and America fell in love with Kennedy. They just felt he was young, he was, you know, energetic, he was, he was charismatic. They just fell in love with him. And then th th we saw a huge flip-flop in the polls, and then Ken Kennedy ends up being elected. Now, right or wrong, I'm saying we don't vote based right. on emotions or based on feelings or because we like the way someone looks. Um, the second thing is uh, he wouldn't vote based on what other people say about a candidate. You touched on social media. It, don't, don't listen to what the media says or what your friends and family have to say or, or anything else, uh, personal opinions. Think about who are the candidates running? What, what is truly their heart? What is their policies if they've made their policies clear? Uh, and, and, and really just try to understand, okay, what do they stand for? I need to understand this before I go to the poll. Polls, right. right? And the third thing is uh, he wouldn't vote based on gender or ethnicity, would he? Right. How, how ridiculous is it to say, I've always wanted a female president, right? Or I've always wanted a black president. Right. 
right? Or I've always wanted a, a, a white man that's truly orange, right? Did you think that was funny? I thought it was funny. She said, don't say it, but I thought I have to say that. It's not like he listens to me anyway. <laughs> I have to say that because that's funny, right? Sorry, dad joke. So don't, you, don't, you don't vote for somebody simply because of their color or their eth ethnicity. And that has nothing to do with the job that they're going to perform as we employ them as citizens of the United States. It has nothing to do with anything. We should be looking at their policies as compared to the word of God. So the following was God's instruction to Samuel. By the way, first service, they thought it was hilarious. You guys are really behind on that joke. That was really good. <laughs> His instruction to Samuel in regards to selecting a king or a president, if you will. And he says this in 1 Samuel 16 and 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height. For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance. Isn't that the truth? But the Lord, what does he look at? He looks at the heart, right? Some of you all, or maybe someone you know, might be the type of person that says, well, I'm just not going to vote at all. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to make a point because I don't like, you know, I don't like either of the candidates. So I'm just going to make a point. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to vote. Think about what you're saying. Because on election day, when everyone gets on the news or on social to find out who our new president is, the people that made the point are the people who voted. Right. Those are the ones that made the point because they will have declared who our next president was. Right. You're not making a point. Nobody cares that you didn't vote. You're not making a point at all. And, and, and as Misty said earlier, if the godly don't speak up and speak out and use the voice that's God, that God's given us to vote, then the ungodly will. Why are we going to sit idly by and allow that to happen? We shouldn't. So, so don't waste your vote trying to make a point that no one will get. Instead, use your vote as your voice to make a difference. Uh, and some of you might say, well, I can't vote because I, I don't. I can't fully support 100% either of the candidates. Think about how dumb that is just for a second. Just for a second, think about it. Think about any human being that you know that you agree with 100%. Think about it. Think about it as a, I don't know, let's say as a church. I promise you, if I was to interview every one of you individually and you were completely honest with me, I promise you there is some things or maybe many things that you don't really care for about the way we do church. And that's okay. Because the reality is, guess what? You're here, right? right? And we're all worshiping together and we all love God and we're going after right. Jesus. There's, I'm not gonna find a church anywhere right. where I'm like, man, they nailed it. I checked everything off, everything I ever wanted in a church. They've got it. I think maybe a better example would be marriage. How many of you guys are married? Should I even go here? I mean, were you really able to check every single thing off? Right. Or did you say, well, this is the best that God gave me. This is what he offered. So I'm not saying me. I'm saying maybe a guy I know or maybe someone you know. And do you agree with your spouse 100% of the time? No. No. No, not There's at all. There's no way. So God, but God uses, God uses flawed people yes. though, doesn't he? Yes, Think about he does. it. Amen. Neither of these candidates are, are we going to hundred percent say, Agree man, everything. yes, yeah. everything lines up according to scripture. Right. This person has it. You're not going to find a candidate, but God, you look all through the word of God from cover to cover. God uses flawed people, even yeah. the people standing on this stage, yeah. but yeah. God can still be glorified through us flawed people. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's you. And that's me. We're Amen. flawed, Amen. but God uses us. Amen. So don't say you're not going to vote for somebody because they're not perfect. Yeah. That's ridiculous. You think about King David, probably the most popular king in all of the word of God. And he was known as a man after God's own heart. And yet he was an adulterer and a murderer. And I could go down the list of some other things. God uses flawed people. So we can't let that be an excuse to say, I can't go to the polls and let my voice be heard. This morning, I want to take you for a moment to Matthew chapter five. And as I do, we're going to now look at how would Jesus vote? If Jesus was here in the flesh, how would he vote? I can tell you exactly how he would vote. And he would vote according to biblical values, period. Not his own personal opinion, 
not his own preferences on how things should be. What does the word of God say? And he would line it up and choose the candidate that best fit the word of God. Because the the word of God is the holy standard by which we as human beings make our decisions. God gave us his word so we would know how to make decisions according to his will. Exactly. So go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. This is Jesus teaching the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? Nope. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, I want you to think about what is salt. We still have salt today. Salt is a preservative. Agreed? We're all on the same page? Okay. Salt is a preservative, and it's used to slow down the process of decay. Salt is not going to preserve something forever, but salt will slow down the process of decay. Now, you notice when Jesus said this to his disciples and to his followers, he didn't say, you are the salt of the church. He didn't say that. He said, you're the salt of the, wor- the world or the earth. We are to, when we vote, choose a candidate that is going to best slow down the moral decay of our nation. Because listen, you go into the Old Testament and you look at wicked, evil kings that reigned, like King Ahab and Jezebel, which was the worst and the most wicked in all of the Bible. Not only did they allow it in their culture, not only did they allow wickedness because the godless were in charge, but they celebrated it. I want you to think about that in conjunction to our nation today. When the godless rule, sin is celebrated. It's not just tolerated, it's literally celebrated. Jesus has called us to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. It's time that we stand up and be that light. You know, I think to myself, I was telling Brad earlier as we were studying um, for today's message, I said, why is it? Why is it that people don't want to have conversations about faith and politics around their dinner table? Why is that? I want you to really think, oh, I don't like conflict. Nobody likes conflict. But you know, if your loved ones are lost and they don't know Jesus, do you realize that they're going to spend eternity in hell? That's the word of God. Yet we don't want conflict. Do you realize That if the godless rule our nation, it will impact not only your life, but your children and your children's children. Yet we don't want the conflict. You know why I believe we don't want the conflict? Because at the end of the day, I think there's way too many believers who don't know why they believe what they believe. Because they're not opening this word and understanding it for themselves so they can stand on it for their own life, for their family, for their church, and for this nation. Amen. And, you know, we're never going to fully stop the erosion of, of moral decay in our country. It's never going to happen. But we can do our best to slow it down through our, our prayer and our fasting and our voting. We can slow That's it right. down. There will be a day one day when Jesus establishes his, th- his throne in Zion and we rule and reign with him yes. in the millennial reign. Yes. Then, yes. then moral decay will stop and we will be with him forever. But until then, it is our job as the local church to slow down the process as much as we possibly can. So we're going to spend the next few moments just talking about five key policies that you need to be aware of biblically before you head to the polls. Now, before I get into any of this, all right, uh, this is surely to ruffle some feathers. All right, before I get into it, let's make one thing really, really clear. None of this is an attack towards people. It's an attack on ideas that have attacked the word of God. Not against people, against ideas that are contrary to the holy word of God. All right, you guys ready to get into this? Yep, good, great, two people, fantastic. (laughs) The first thing let's talk about is border security, all right? This is a really, really big policy that's on the table right now. And again, we are not telling you who to vote for. We're your pastors. It's not our job to influence you to vote for a particular person. It is our job to educate you as to what the Word of God says. So just know that, all right? So uh, in regards to border security, 
Um, we, we want you to know, too, that if you, this is not an attack on immigrants, this is not an attack on any ethnicity, any, any, uh, anyone from any particular country, uh, and know this, if you are an immigrant, or you're an illegal immigrant, or your family is an illegal immigrant, know this very clearly, God loves you. This church loves you. There is no attack towards you whatsoever. In fact, we're commanded in scripture to love the stranger, to not oppress the stranger, but to bless the stranger and, and look out for them. So that is biblically mandated by God. So this is not an attack on people, but this is an attack on the stupidity of having a border that is unsecure. Okay. And so in Acts 17 and 26, it says from one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth, right? Yeah. God created the nations. Who created the nations? God, yeah. God created the nations yeah. all over the earth. And he decided yes. beforehand when they should rise and when they should fall. Yep. And he determines their what? Their boundaries. I could give you Example after example after example after example, all through scripture from cover to cover of how God is all about walls. God is all about protecting borders. Probably the most familiar to all of us is the story of Nehemiah. God yeah. called him and gave him all the resources he needed to rally all the people of Israel together to rebuild the wall that the enemy had tore down. Why would an enemy want to tear down your wall? So they can attack the people, right? right? And so they can do all sorts of evil things, right? Walls are biblical. It's all throughout Scripture. Make no mistake about it. And you need to understand this. This is, this is not just hearsay. This is directly from the Department of Homeland Security. This is, this is stats directly from them. Out of the millions and millions of immigrants who have come across our borders illegally, and we have no problem with, with people wanting to become American citizens, right? We have no problem. If you want to come and you want to make a contribution to this country and, yeah. be, and be a part of making it better, no problem. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's right. We welcome you, right? If you're going to contribute yeah. in some way, right? But here's the problem. Out of the millions that have crossed our border illegally, 425,000 are known to have had criminal records when they crossed the border. 425,000 with criminal records. 16,000 we know of, that we know of, have entered our nation as convicted rapists. Now, I don't know how that sets with you, but I can't stand the thought of knowing that there are convicted rapists loose in our country. Third is 13,000 entered as convicted murderers. We know that they're murderers. And they're in our country. They've crossed our borders. So here's my question. You may not like this. I told you already I love you. And then I said I didn't care, remember? Where was the border czar? Right. For the last almost four years, Kamala Harris's responsibility was to protect the people, was to protect our borders. And here we have millions and millions and millions of people, and I just gave you the stats, of criminals and people who we know could cause danger or harm to the citizens of this country, right? We know this. So where was she? That's the question. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but I am going to ask you this question. You need to ask yourself this question before you go to the polls. Which candidate will better protect us and uphold our national security according to the word of God? Whoever you think, vote for that person. All right, the second policy we're going to look at is religious liberty. Now, I told you earlier, you should go read Romans chapter 13. And when you read Romans chapter 13, you're going to see that God has commanded us that we should honor and respect those in authority over us. That would be our governmental authorities up until the point that what our governmental authorities tell us to do goes against what God has told us to do. I couldn't be any more clear. Listen to me. Over the last few years, we have seen the craziest things happen. Should a Christian doctor who has a conscience be required to perform an abortion? If he is a Christian man, should he be required? See, you can talk back, okay? You guys are all scared. You're in church right now. No, absolutely not. 
Should he lose his license because he won't perform an abortion? Absolutely not. Should a Christian baker or videographer or photographer, should they honestly have a lawsuit come against them and be prosecuted because they're not willing to participate in a gay marriage? The answer is no. We have freedom. We have rights in this country and our religious liberties are coming up against attack. Listen, should a school teacher who dedicated their life to educating our children, should they lose their job because they choose to not call someone by a pronoun that does not match up with the identity by which God created them from the moment of their birth? No. You need to understand who stands for what. It is not about personality. It's about their policy. Where do they stand? When you go to the polls, the question is, which candidate is more likely to protect our religious liberty. That's good. Next thing we want to talk about is uh, gender identity. And uh, before I get into this one, again, I want to reiterate, this is not an attack on any people. This is an attack on ideas, okay? God makes it really, really, really clear in his word what he asks, what he thinks about this. And I just want to tell you, if you are a person that identifies by a different gender in which you were born, or if you, or if you practice transgenderism, uh, if you are a practicing homosexual, any of those things, know this, God loves you. Jesus loves you. This church, make no mistake about it. I love that I'm saying this on broadcast. I'm looking in the camera. This church loves you. You are welcome to worship in this church, to come to this church and participate in any of our activities at any point in time. And you will be loved because we are a family of unconditional love and honor, period, right. period. Yeah. This is not an attack on people. This, the, the, the church is here for people. That's why we're here, is to rescue people and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ according to the word of God. Well, and you need to understand, as I said earlier, that anything that God created, the enemy wants to twist and twist distort and, distort and, and confuse and pervert. And this is one thing right now that the enemy is working overtime on. Yeah. You know, people have struggled with identity probably since the beginning of history. But right now, the enemy is so bringing confusion in the mind of our children. And he's doing it because he hates God. And he knows that you were created in the image of God. God himself with a purpose and a destiny. And the enemy wants to twist and distort that and bring confusion. And right now, he's doing it. So you, you referenced Genesis 1 and 27, which says, so God created human beings in his own image. In whose image were humans created? God's image, right? In the image of God, he created them what? Male and female. That's how he created them. And so what does this mean? God decides what gender we are. We don't. That, that's not our decision. It's God's decision. God, his word says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made by him. That he knew you in your mother's womb. He knew you way before you were ever even born. And he gave you and assigned for you great works that he had in store for you to do. God had a purpose for you long ago. So you need to understand that. And he created you just the way you are. And he loves you. So if you, if you support this idea, though, here's really what you're saying, whether you like it or not. Uh, you're calling God a liar. Whether you like it or not, you are rebelling against his creative design. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, you are attacking the institution of the family which was created by God. Here's some, this is where it gets really interesting. And, and some of you may not have known the things I'm about to share with you. So you really need to pay attention to this next part, okay? Because this is where it gets serious. Currently, there are 14 states in the U.S. that uh, have what is called transgender health care shield laws, all right, if you've heard of this. Minnesota is, is among the 14. Governor Tim Waltz, you know that he's uh, Kamala Harris's running mate, and he is potentially the next vice president of the United States, and you need to know this about him. He signed legislation making Minnesota a trans refuge state. Here's what that means. Let's throw the definition up here. If a child has not been able to attain gender-affirming care, isn't it interesting that the wicked give titles to things and make them sound not so bad? Gender-affirming care is not, none other than a sex change. Right. That's what that is. So if a child is not able to obtain a sex change 
because one or both parents of that child object, all they have to do is cross the Minnesota state line and the state will allow courts to have what is called temporary emergency jurisdiction over the child. Here's what that means in short. They will take custody of your child. And then, and then they will cover the cost and protect that child until the sex change is performed without you even knowing about it. Does that bother you? Yeah. Does that bother yeah. anybody? Yeah. Now, there's, now you're saying, okay, well, there's only 14 states. If, if you do not vote yeah. according to the word of God, eventually it'll be all 50 states. That's right. This is the country that you live in. That's right. 14 states are allowing children to come over if, the, if their parents don't agree with them having a sex change and they will pay for it. They will accommodate them however they need to until the sex surgery is performed. It's absolutely perverse and it is disgusting. Here's the question you need to ask yourself as we try to slow down the moral decay of our nation. Which candidate will oppose or is less like, likely to support transgender ideology in America? All right, let's look at the third one. This has been a big debate for many, many years, and that is human life. Now, before we even teach this, I want to help you to understand something, as Brad said just a moment ago. We have read that the statistics is one out of four women have had an abortion. And so I want to just tell you, if you're here today and that's you, we love you. And my heart breaks for you. Because I know the, the after effect, I've read so much about it, the grief that comes. Because again, the enemy in John 10 and 10, the Bible says that he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so we want you to know that we love you and that God loves you and that there is forgiveness and that there is grace. But church, we need to understand where does God stand mm -hmm. on abortion? Where does God stand? Listen. So many times when we talk about political issues, we say, I think. What does it matter what you or I think? We did not create the world or the institutions of our culture. What matters is what does God think and what does God say and how did God create us to live? That's all that matters. I mean, look at every other area of our life. We want to know what does God say about marriage? What does God say about parenting? What does God say? And so I want to tell you this morning, church, you need to understand what does God say? Don't ask what you think. I want you to know what God says. Psalms 139 and 13 says this, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Jeremiah 1.5 says, God said this, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. What does this tell me? This tells me that every single individual who has been given life by God, life only can come by God and no one else. When God forms a baby in a mother's womb, he puts inside of that baby a purpose and a calling and a destiny to be lived out. You need to understand that because at the end of the day, what we try to do is we try to discuss all of these variables and I'm not making light of any of them. I want to tell you a story. When Brad and I were student pastors, um, before we planted Mountain Movers Church, we had a young girl who was 13 years of age and she was raped by her stepfather. Horrible, ho horrible, tragic situation. And because of this situation... The family being devastated were trying to convince the 13-year-old little girl that she needed to abort the baby. And justifying so, they were saying, I mean, this was rape. It was her stepfather. Like, how could she possibly, how could this baby be raised in this family? They were trying to justify all of these things. They brought the 13-year-old little girl, and I say little girl because she was, to Brad and I, and asked us, what we thought. And I said, you know, it really doesn't matter what I think. What I think is my heart is broken for you in this situation. But here's what I know. And we begin to explain what the word of God says, that this child has life because it's been given to this baby by God, period. This 13-year-old little, little girl, she chose to have that baby 
And that baby was born healthy and whole, a beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl who has now grown up. That girl is now in her late teenage years. And I just want to tell you, I could tell you story after story after story of pastors even that you would probably know their name if I told you who their mom was raped and people tried to influence them to say, just abort, it's okay. That was a horrible, tragic situation that was out of your control. Yet the moms chose to not abort and in many cases gave them up for adoption. And we understand that. But God has used those men and women mightily to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what that tells me? Is whatever the enemy has meant for evil, God can turn for good. Amen. And so the fact is, just like Proverbs 31, 8 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. These babies, millions, millions, way beyond 60 million babies have been aborted in the United States of America. They don't have a voice, but you and I do. We need to use our voice. It, it was interesting. Last service when we were sharing this, at this exact moment, there was an infant in the room and just started belting out crying and, and just so loud. And I just, I knew in that moment, I said, this isn't just a coincidence, but just imagine how the blood of these babies are crying out from the ground to God. Yeah. Just think of it and how it just has completely broken and shattered God's heart. Just think, think of the, the tragedy that has taken place in this nation and how grieved God must be. But, you know, there's grace and forgiveness, and we have a voice, and so we need to vote. And I want to share one other thing with you. Currently, Kamala Harris, where she stands on this issue of life, is she believes there should not be any restrictions on abortion. I want you to understand what that means. No restrictions that a baby could be aborted up till the moment of birth, nine months in. I want you to think about that. I know we don't even like to think about it. We don't want to go watch the movie that's about it. We don't want to think about it because that, that grieves us. It should grieve us. That should grieve us because a nine-month-old baby can feel pain. And the only way for that abortion to be performed is to dislimb them. It's disgusting. It breaks God's heart. And listen, right now in the state of Missouri, one of the things that you, if you live in Missouri, will be on your ballot on November 5th is an amendment called the Amendment 3. And I want you to just snap a picture. I don't have time to go through this with you, but you need to know what these amendments are about in any state that you live. You need to look them up. You need to understand when you're voting yes or you're voting no, because they are written very, very intelligently in a way that unless you study it, you don't understand what you're saying yes or no to. One of the things that is crazy to me that is happening through this amendment is just exactly what I said, that you can have an abortion all the way up to the moment of birth. Another thing is that there would be no parental consent needed. Listen to me, parents. No parental consent. That means your child could have an abortion, your daughter could have an abortion without you even knowing about it. And it would be legal in the state of Missouri. That's a little too close to home. Get out and let your voice be heard. I'll throw in one more thing, if just if you're concerned about uh, where Kamala Harris stands on abortion. During the National Democratic Convention, uh, they had mobile abortion clinics parked out front like food trucks, and they were performing abortions while the convention was happening. And there was banners with hashtags. What did that shout? Shout your abortion. Shout your abortion. So, so this isn't something that, you know, we're trying to do a noble thing because, you know, there are young women who have just been, have fallen in really rough circumstances and they need help and the situation's not good for them. No, abortion is, 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 being, um, is being disgustingly celebrated and, and these babies are being murdered. And so I'm just telling you uh, really what we're up against right now. So when you go to the ballot, you need to make sure and you ask the question, right, who is going to be more likely to, to, to be pro-life uh, when, when you go to the, uh, the, the voting booth? The, the, the final thing that we want to talk about, and this really probably should have been the first thing, because this, I believe, is nearest and dearest to God's heart, and that is the nation of Israel. Uh, America, if you don't know, we are the number one ally 
of Israel. We have supported them more than any other country. And uh, I want to tell you, the reason Israel is so important is because Israel is God's chosen people. According to his word, yeah. Jesus the Messiah came through this lineage. And our promise is found through Israel, through Jesus. And he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, this is the promise. God says, I will bless those that bless Israel, and I will curse those that curse Israel. Israel. Right. So what you need to understand is uh, a couple things. You know, again, you're not going to find a perfect candidate, okay? Right. But this is interesting. Uh, former President Trump, when he was in office, he actually moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, and he now holds the title of being the most pro-Israel president in our American history. He did huge things for Israel. I, you know, I also have, a, there's a few things that he did that I didn't care for, because that you do not mess with the land of Israel. You don't ask them to cease fire. You don't ask them to change their borders. You don't ask them to do anything that God hasn't already asked them to do. You bless them. You honor them. You help them. And as long as we do that, we'll be blessed as a nation. So if you want to live in a country that's blessed, vote for a candidate that is going to uh, be the biggest blessing yeah. to Israel. All right. Has this information helped you today? Yeah. I hope that it's helped you. Uh, I hope it's been informative. And here's what we're asking. I want to make it extremely clear what our challenge is to you. We're, again, we're not telling you who to vote for. I don't think we have to. If you have a moral conscience and you and you can clearly see what God's word says, you know how to vote. But here, here's what we're challenging you with today. Vote. We're asking you to vote. We're asking you to use the voice that God has given you. We're asking you to stand as the body of Christ and use the, 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 the freedom that God has given you and exercise your right to vote. That's what we're asking as the church of Jesus Christ. Let's make a difference. Let's make a difference. And let's, let's ask God to bless this nation because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Let's pray today. Father God, we are grateful for your word, grateful that you have given us this holy standard to live by. Grateful, God, that we can turn to your word when it comes to making decisions like these grateful, God, that you speak to your people through the Holy Bible. I pray that you would stir our hearts, all of those sitting in this room right now, all of those watching online, all of those that, that will watch the rebroadcast. Father God, I pray that you would stir the hearts of all believers for such a time as this to use the voice that you have given us to exercise the power and the right to vote and that we would vote according to biblical values. And we are praying, God, that you would heal this nation. We are repenting of our sins, God. We are crying out to you, God, as a nation, and we are saying we are sorry for our sins. And we are asking you to forgive us. And we're asking, that God, that you would hear from heaven. We are asking that you would heal our land until Jesus comes, God. Bless this nation whose God is the Lord. We love you, Father God, and we thank you for your presence today and for your word. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we, we want to ask you today, we never end a service without giving you the opportunity to know Jesus as your personal Savior. So if you're watching online or if you're in this room, listen, we are sinners. This is what separates us from a relationship with God. We're sinners. And we need God's forgiveness and His grace. And so if you want to know Him, have relationship with Him and make heaven your home, you have to ask Him to forgive you of your sins. You have to confess your sins to him and believe in your heart that it's only through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of the resurrection that you can be given new life. You have to confess Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. It's all about surrender. So I'm asking you today with heads bowed and eyes closed, do you surrender your life to him? Do you trust Jesus to give you new life through his death? With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you today, we're going to pray this prayer together. If you're online, comment all in in the comment section below. If you're in this room, would you just raise your hand? And we're going to pray in this place together if that's you. I see your hand on my left. Anybody else today? Raise your hand if you say, I want to know Jesus. I want to make heaven my home. I want to confess my sins to the Lord today if that's you. Amen.
Amen. Let's pray this prayer, church. Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess Him to be Lord of my life. Change me, mold me, and make me into who you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. If you are one today that you just surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to just commend you. That is the best decision you'll ever make. I want to invite you to text the words life change. Text life change to 844-MMC-NEXT. This is going to give you a message from Red and I on what do you do after you pray the prayer of salvation? Well, as Brandy said a few moments ago, new life groups do kick off today at one o'clock. They launch on, on our app and on the website. Make sure you're getting signed up. We want you to be connected so that you can be growing. Be a part of Midweek Tuesday, Wednesday. We love you guys. Have a great week. Love y'all. We'll see you.